Open Arms Community Church into part one of our new series, Breaking Bad. I want to invite you to open up the program that was given to you as you came in today to the outline of today's discussion. As we talk about Breaking Bad, there was a very, uh, very famous and well-known series on TV called Breaking Bad, and thanks to Netflix and Hulu, the uh, lifespan of that TV show has continued, and it continues in its popularity. And this is a story about a guy who is diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. He's a family man, a school teacher, chemistry teacher, and so he finds himself in this horrible situation of my family is going to be without me very soon, and there's nothing left to take care of them. And so in his mind, he's got to come up with a a strategy, a plan to make as much money as quick as possible to be able to take care of his family once he's gone. And what he does is he partners with a former student of his, and they go in the business of being a drug dealer. And they create crystal meth, and they sell it, and he makes all kinds of money. And in this story, while it to some degree kind of glorifies uh, doing wrong or, or justifies doing wrong based on the circumstances, it also does depict many of the heartaches and the pains and the brokenness that goes with those kinds of decisions. So this phrase, break bad, breaking bad, it became very, very popular. And in the world without Jesus, it has a particular meaning. So I want to introduce that to you. Breaking bad, based on the world's definition or this popular TV show, you'll notice in your outlines, it means to figuratively to go wild to defy authority, to break the law, to be verbally combative or belligerent. So basically to do everything wrong, okay? To go in the wrong direction, to follow down the wrong path. Now, why in the world would anyone do that intentionally, on purpose? And I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up a Christian, so Breaking Bad came pretty easily to me. To go wild, to defy authority whether it was going out partying or messing around with the girls or breaking into houses, stealing cars, getting into fights. I mean, all of those things, my pals and I, we thought that was fun, which basically leads us to that there are three reasons. It's not in your outline. There are three rationales, though, or attitudes or motives behind us breaking bad as the world describes it. The first is YOLO, baby! For those of us that are too old, YOLO stands for you only live once, right? And all the kids are going, he should never say that again. (laughs) You only live once. And so we get this idea that we're going to go out and might as well live it up, right? You get one life, might as well make the most of it, go out and have fun, go out with a bang, and so we, we look for the, the highest tide, the coolest cool, the greatest thrill, right? And for some of us, we do it because we're chasing after a thrill. For some of us, we do it because there's a void. There's this gaping, aching hole on the inside that's empty And it's a place that God is supposed to fill. It's a a place that love is supposed to fill. And because we're not finding that in the Lord, maybe because we're not finding it in our family or our friendships, we go chasing after something that will fill that void, something that will dull that ache and that pain. And here's the problem with this first rationale, this first attitude, is that enough is never enough. And what it takes to get you that that feeling, that thrill, that buzz, that high. It'll take more the next time, and it'll take even more the next time. So you have to do more. You have to find a higher high. You have to get crazier, more twisted, more perverted in order to find the same thrill and excitement and fulfillment. 
And so what the Bible describes as depravity, we go down this path and it's a downward spiral, this breaking bad, where we don't just stay in the same place, we just continue to get worse and worse, darker and darker. And it takes more and more to get us that feeling. And the crazy part is that while we're on that path, we actually glory in these things that a year or two or five or 20 years ago, we would have looked at and never seen ourselves there. We looked at and we're like, that's, that's wrong or that's gross or I, that's just, you know, stupid. I would never do that. And we were on the outside looking in, pointing the finger, and now here we stand, glorying in it. Man, can you believe John? He was so messed up. He was puking everywhere. How's that cool? And we'll glory in. I remember my buddies and I, we would glory in or brag about how messed up, how wasted we were or how badly we beat somebody up or how we knocked somebody's mailbox off, right? Scripture tells us this is the path we go on when we go down this path as the world describes as breaking bad. Notice in Philippians 3 it says, they are headed for destruction. So whether you think it's cool or fun and taking you to a place you want to go in life or not, here's reality. It's a path that is headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. That phrase gets me. Because what is the driving force most commonly in our lives? Is it not what we desire strongly for? The Bible word for strong desire is lust. And we may lust glory and fame. We may lust more stuff. We may lust for more toys, more money. We may lust for some kind of gratification. And it may be in drink. It may be in drugs. It may be in sex. It may be in food. But whatever it is, that appetite for more, that craving, that desire becomes the driving force, the controlling force of our life. And we find ourselves ruled by it to such a degree that we destroy ourselves. We don't have to blame God. We don't even have to blame the devil. Friends, when we're in old age and we're so heavy that we can't get around and our diabetes has flared up because we're eating the wrong stuff, guess what? We did it to ourselves. When our liver is hard and dead and no longer functioning because we spent a lifetime abusing alcohol, we destroyed ourselves. When we're sitting in the doctor's office and they announce to us that we have lung cancer or throat cancer because we chewed or we smoked. We did that to ourselves. We will want to blame God. We will want to even maybe blame the devil. But we did it to ourselves. We have become our own worst enemies because somehow in our minds, breaking bad is cool. And so notice, we, it goes on to say their God is their appetite and they brag about shameful things. Isn't that what we do? I remember my brother and we were laughing because he, could, he ate five plates of Chinese food. And we were bragging about it until he was vomiting, which, by the way, is called gluttony and it's wrong. Okay, so here we are, our God is our appetite, and notice we brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. Not only do we glory in it, or we brag about it with our buddies, but notice Romans chapter 1 continues the the journey, it says, they know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. 
Not only do they do them anyway, so I know I shouldn't smoke, not because it's going to send me to hell, but it destroys my life and the lives of the people around me. I know I shouldn't get drunk, not just because it's morally wrong, but it hurts me and it hurts the people around me. Okay? I mean, we could go on and on. But the reality is, is not only do we do these things in spite of knowing this, worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So it's bad enough we decide to engage in these breaking bad behaviors and going down a path that hurts ourselves and the people around us. But then we say, what a good time it is and everyone should come along on the journey. And so we do have a world that is, by the world's definition, breaking bad and suffering the consequences. And so this morning, a friend of mine is grieving the loss of a friend who died of a heroin overdose last night. And so there are parents and siblings and and uh, extended family that are grieving that loss. It didn't just hurt that person. And who else did they influence to be a part of that scene? And how many parents have to struggle through watching their child come home and say, I'm pregnant? You know our story, for those of you that are a part of our church. You know, my wife got pregnant in high school. That's hard on a mom and dad. It's hard on the kid. It was not easy. How easy is it on parents as the state police roll up to the, their house and arrest their kid? Been there done that I put my parents through hell all in the name of YOLO it's cool we're gonna be cool and and this this attitude of you only live once so go make go out and with a bang and have fun and do be wild and crazy it feeds a second rationale for this behavior and that is this that we don't want to be left out or made fun of we don't want to be the uncool people we want to be a part of the cool kids a part of the cool crowd and so we will do things so that we can be one of them so we can belong we're going to go out and and get drunk, even though on the inside we got that gut check saying, don't do it. We're going to go out and we're going to watch things or do things. We're going to be mean to people so we can fit in with a certain crowd. It happens all the time. The third reason that we would engage in this breaking bad behavior is that we start to justify in our minds, well, I've got to do this because I need to help my family or my friend. I need to provide. And so we start to justify. We start to justify cutting corners, taking shortcuts, and even doing things illegally. As in the TV show, this man who was an educator, a teacher, a person that young people were supposed to be able to look up to, who would be a model of behavior, here he is trafficking drugs, right? And how, friends, how did he justify that? Well, my family needs to be taken care of i got to make as much money as fast as I can so that they won't be without. Does that really justify contributing to the addiction and possibly, possibly their death? Is that justifiable? No. No, it's not. But notice in your outline, some will justify their wrongdoings by their right intentions. 
And for those of us that fall into this category, you remember that age-old phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. No, it doesn't justify us breaking the law. It doesn't justify us cheating, stealing, or anything else. Doing wrong. While we may be unclear about breaking bad and, and doing all of this wrong, God is very clear. And we see what he has to say about it in Galatians chapter 5. Notice it says, the acts of the sinful nature. Beside the word acts, write the word fruit. Because that's the context of Galatians chapter 5, is, is he's using this metaphor of a tree bearing fruit. And we're going to elaborate a little bit on that in a moment. So, The acts or the fruit of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as you look down that list, there's probably some things that we can all relate to. I want to read the same portion of text out of another translation called the Message Bible. So it's not in your outline. So just listen up to how it describes this same uh, text. It says, it is obvious what, the ki- what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants. Wow. A brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes and divided lives. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on and on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way you will not inherit God's kingdom. So as thrilling and as pleasurable as some of these behaviors may seem, we see God warning us. Notice in your outlines, life experience and God both warn us of this way of life and its consequences, some being irreversible. When we go out and we get drunk and we wreck a car, the car can be replaced. But as a buddy of mine that I led into that party scene, I influenced into the drug and alcohol scene, one time wrecked his car, lost his fingers on his hand, those are not replaceable. As we see in the paper on a regular basis of lives being lost due to drunk driving, guess what? Those lives are not replaceable. And when our children come home with a uh, venereal disease or, or pregnancy, guess what? You've got some consequences to walk through. When a husband or a wife comes home and they have an addiction that they've been hiding, guess what? There are some consequences to walk through. When one of them decided to step out and have an affair, guess what? There are some consequences to walk through. And it's not just the perpetrator. It's not just the one who did the wrong that's going to have to go through the pain of those consequences. It affects more than ourselves. So this breaking bad lifestyle, as the world describes it and defines it, 
God warns us and says, it's not everything they say that it is. And in fact, it takes you down a road you really don't want to travel on. It takes you into places and into experience that, though sweet for the moment, are bitter for a very, very long time and sometimes for a lifetime. God's warnings are not to make us feel condemned, make us feel how dirty and bad we are. We don't need God to tell us we're wrong. We know that, don't we? No, God's warnings are to wake us up and say, as long as you're hearing this, it's not too late. To get off of that path, off of that road, and get onto the right one. Stop traveling down that path. What are some of the warnings? Let's look very quickly. Proverbs chapter 5, God tells us, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. So evil deeds, wrong behavior, is a trap. It's a snare. Now get this. The cords of their sin Hold them fast. And isn't that what happens? Once you do one wrong, it gets easier to do the next. And eventually it just becomes your habit. It becomes your normal way of of behaving or thinking or speaking. And then you try to stop it and it's hard, isn't it? Verse 23, for lack of discipline, they will die led astray by their own great folly. So what did we learn about heading down this path? It leads to destruction. Isn't that what Philippians said? And here we see that they will. They'll go down that path and they will die. And they can't blame God. They can't even blame the devil. It's their own great folly. We are our own worst enemy sometimes. So here we see God warning us of mortal peril, okay? Troubles, hardship, consequences, pain and brokenness in this life because of this breaking bad path that we may decide to go down. Now, another warning found in Galatians chapter 6 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so in this text, we see that again, as you and I move down a path of breaking bad, going wild, doing whatever feels good, doing what the world says is fun, but defying authority, specifically God's authority, from the flesh we reap what? Destruction. And the destruction that it is talking about here is not just in this life, not just brokenness, pain, or death in this life. And we can see because of the context of the next sentence, part of the sentence, it says, whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And so the destruction is not just, God's not warning us about the destruction that awaits us if we go down this path in this world, but also what's beyond this world. So there is some immortal peril as well that God warns us of. And again, why does God warn us? Because he wants us to change. The Bible word for change is repent. So as you read your Bible, you may see that word. And what it means is to change directions, change the road you're on. The truth is, when it comes to this breaking bad behavior in a big way or small way, we all have engaged in breaking bad somehow. We've all engaged in wrongdoing in one way or another, right? Big or small. This wrongdoing, God calls sin, and you'll notice in Romans 3, it says, for everyone. So, who do you think that includes? How many? Yeah, that's an all-inclusive word. 
So there is not a single human being excluded from what we're about to read. And God says, for everyone has what? Sinned. We've all broke bad. We've all done wrong as the world describes it. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So God has a perfect standard, how things should be, and then there is how things are. And we're not measuring up. And unfortunately, we're not measuring up because we choose to not measure up. We do things that have disqualified us. And unfortunately, now there's really nothing we can do about that. But I want to elaborate a little bit here. So, all have sinned. So in your outlines, take a look at this next statement. Sins, though, are only the symptom to the core problem of sin. See, we all have sinned. But when we read in Galatians, remember it said the acts of the sinful nature are, and then it lists all of these behaviors. And I had you write the word fruit there because many of us look at our sins and we think, I'm going to change that. And imagine going up to an apple tree and deciding, I don't want that to be an apple tree anymore. So I'm going to pick off all the apples. Does that change that that tree is going to produce more apples? No. And that's oftentimes, friends, why we struggle so much with our bad habits and our problems is that we look at our life and we just focus on the sins, plural. We are focusing on the fruit, the symptom that's being produced externally. We're looking at all the apples and saying, I don't like that fruit, I want something different. So I'm going to go pick off all the fruit so that I can be a different kind of tree. But here's the issue. The sins are just the fruit. They're just the symptom of an internal problem. It's a heart problem. That apple tree produces apples because of what's on the inside, not because of the apples that are hanging on the branches. If you want to change that tree from producing apples to something else, you would have to change the nature of that tree. You would have to change the heart of that tree. Many of us always, we get sucked into the symptoms. I mean, think about it. Somebody ends up in the hospital. Oh, what was the problem? Oh, he had a heart attack. No, that heart attack was a symptom of another problem, a heart sickness, okay, that led to the symptom of a heart attack. Why are we addicted to something? Why is it that something is, is having a negative influence in our life? Why do we find ourselves at the mercy of a substance? Why are we caving in and looking at things we shouldn't look at? Or maybe blowing our top? Why are we constantly getting angry and, and in a rage towards people? Why do we have to live vicariously through our children? Why can't we handle our money wise enough to keep ourselves out of debt? Think about it. There's a million and one things we could talk about today. And when we look at it, we always look at the fruit. Well, I need to change that. I need to lose weight. I need to... Listen. Here's the problem. The problem isn't that I'm smoking, drinking, drugging, sexing. The problem is that I've got a heart issue. The problem's on the inside. And if I want to change the fruit that's on the outside, then I've got to change what is on the inside. So, Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said it this way, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, 
murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person that makes them unclean, dirty, disqualified for the kingdom of God. Where did Jesus say the problem is? It's in the heart. And we need to understand this because too many of us are trying, trying, trying. We're even praying that God will help us, right? And we fail over and over and over again at beating our problems and getting our life turned around and and finding the freedom that we're seeking. Why? Because we're focusing on the fruit. We're focusing on these external symptoms instead of dealing with the core problem. And the core problem isn't out here, it's right in here. I love it. Why did I go out and fight people? I liked it. Why did I steal cars with my buddies? I liked it. I wanted to. It seemed fun. Why did we break into houses? It, It seemed fun. Why do we do any of the stuff that we do, friends? Is it not because we think it looks fun or it'll give us something that we think we need or want, whether that's pleasure or whether it's a good standing with our buddies, right? Why do we do the things we do? Because we want to, we choose to. Now, there will eventually come a place where if that thing gets a big enough hold in your life, you'll regret it. And you'll question and you'll say, I don't know why I do the things that I do. And that is a a real place. In fact, the Apostle Paul was in that place. And we're going to talk about it. In Romans chapter 7, you can read, he found himself in that same place struggling. I want to do the right, but I end up doing the wrong. And then he gives the secret. How do I break free? He said, I can't do it. I can't. I try and I try and I try. But praise be to God. Through Jesus Christ, we find the freedom. Through the power of God working in us and through us, we find the freedom. When you and I look at our lives and we see smoking, chewing, drinking, whatever, hanging on the branch, and we say, I don't like that. I want to take that out and get rid of it. It's going to grow back. And you can pick it off, pick it off, pick it off, but it's going to grow back. And and when you try to fight the symptom over and over again, treat the symptom and not the problem, it's like putting a Band-Aid over a bullet wound. You really didn't fix anything. All the damage is hidden, but it's there nonetheless. You could even sew that wound shut, but you didn't address the internal injuries, the internal problem. And so guess what? Though you may have sewn it shut and it stopped bleeding on the outside, everything looks okay. Guess what? The problem remains. The problem remains. You and I knowing what's right, you and I having the moral knowledge isn't enough. We all know what we need to do. We need to eat right. Are we eating healthy, making healthy choices in our food? Don't raise your hand. Are we going and working out? Are we getting the exercise that we know we need? Is there anybody that doesn't know we need to exercise to be healthy? And yet, are we doing it? We know we shouldn't do drugs. We know we shouldn't do this, that, and the other, but we do it anyway, don't we? Moral knowledge is not enough to curb the behavior. We need a new heart. And that is not something that you and I can give us. We have seen that we've been traveling down the wrong path. We have seen that we are pretty broken and messed up, left to ourselves. We have seen that breaking bad has made, it us, made us a perverted version, a twisted and broken version of who God created us to be. But here's the real problem. How do we undo it? 
sense, we tend to focus on picking the fruit off the tree, but that doesn't change the heart of the tree. How do you change the heart of a tree? Because we can't go back and unsay what we've said, can we? We can't go back and undo what we've done. We can say we're sorry, but we can't go back and, and fix what's broke. We can't undivorce. We can't bring back a life that we've taken. What do we do? And as you and I come to that realization, we realize there is no help in self-help. We're our problem. And we're not our answer. There's only one who qualifies as the answer, and that's Jesus. He has entered our world, God in the flesh, and he has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. He has provided an exit ramp off of the road of breaking bad as the world describes it, and onto a new road of breaking bad God's way. A road of freedom, a path where we break free from those things that hold us tightly and are keeping our life in brokenness and pain. In the language of the uh, 12-step programs, out there, they've come to this realization that we are, there's no help in self-help. And so step one is admit you have a problem and that you can't fix it. Step two is recognizing and it, that only, our only hope is God. And step three is turn our will and our lives over to the Lord, every part of our life. That's in a, a recovery program and while it was originally founded with Christians, the fact is, is that is a, a program that has been very secularized, removing God from it. And yet you can't remove God from it. He's within the first three steps, right? And why, did, why is it that they're turning to these steps? Because they, there is no other hope. There is no help in self. The only help is what God can and has done for us. So notice in Romans 6, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you and I choose to live out our sin nature, that heart, well, that leads to death. It leads to destruction. But notice what God has done for us. He's given us the gift of eternal life. Romans 10 says, so if you believe deep in your heart that God raised Jesus from the pit of death, and if you voice your allegiance by confessing the truth that Jesus is Lord, then you will be saved. And that word saved, it, it means a whole lot more than just rescued. It means made whole, restored, delivered, protected, provided for. Verse 10, belief begins in the heart and leads to a life that is right with God. Confession departs from our lips and brings eternal salvation. Because what Isaiah said was true, the one who trusts in him will not be disgraced. I don't know about you, but as I spent years and years and years trying to pull the apples off of my tree so that I wouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed in front of family or friends, I found myself again and again experiencing that pain of shame as a new apple began to grow on that same place in the tree. I wasn't good enough. I could never be. I could never change that fruit on my own. Because of because, as Scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. No more shame, no more disgrace, because we have to hide things and then we get found out. No more shame and embarrassment or pain as we get caught doing things that are wrong or inappropriate. No more hurting the people around us because we act out selfishly and put fulfilling our own desires as more important than caring about our family, about our friends. 
No. No. Here in Jesus Christ, friends, we find that hope. We find that freedom. We find that new life. So I want to introduce you to God's definition of breaking bad, which over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about seeing this definition become a reality in our lives so that Romans 10 that we just read can become a reality in our lives, that we can not only be saved and escape hell and gain heaven for eternity, but we can also experience life to the full in this world, freedom from those things that would hold us bound, freedom from the pain and the shame that goes with a self-destructive lifestyle. Wholeness in our families, wholeness in our lives, wholeness in our finances, wholeness in our health by doing it God's way. Breaking bad God's way literally means to surrender to the authority, not defy it, surrender to the authority of Jesus and his work to make us new people from the inside out. Where's our, the core of our problem? Where's the root? What is the key issue? It's not the fruit on the tree. It's what's in the heart of that tree that makes it bear that fruit. Now, I want to be very clear. As you and I are about to take a moment to pray, if you decide today that you're going to break bad God's way, you're going to run to Jesus and put him in charge of your life and do things his way and get his results, if that is the direction you choose today, I do want to make something very, very clear. Coming to Jesus does not mean you will never be tempted again in those same areas or new areas. There is a big difference between being tempted and sinning. And over the next several weeks, we'll talk more about that. But the reality is, is temptation is just simply some, something that is attractive. Okay? It catches your attention. It appeals to you. It's what you do with that temptation. You're human. You live in a broken world where stuff is constantly, temptation is constantly thrown at you. You're going to have to contend with it. You're going to see things that are attractive. You're going to see things. You're going to feel left out by buddies and wish that, man, I wish I could go hang with them and do what they're doing so I could just be a part of the group. There's all kinds of temptations that will cross your path. The question is, what will you do with them? Okay? Coming to Jesus doesn't mean you won't be tempted. It means you will now be empowered to control your choices, your life, so that sin doesn't control you along with all of the brokenness and pain. We're going to talk more extensively next week and over the next three weeks about this spiritual warfare, this battle over your heart and over your mind so that you can walk in freedom. I do want to say, if you're not signed up for a growth group that's going through the book, uh, The Bondage Breaker, I strongly encourage you to do that. Find a day and time that's convenient for you. Get plugged in, because this is not, as we're about to close with a prayer, this is not just go to a church service, say a prayer, and everything's going to be hunky-dory. No more problems. Life's in a new course, a new direction. No, no. See, have you noticed that any time there's a champion, there was something to overcome that made them a champion? There's always going to be resistance against you moving forward in the things of God in your life. And you need to know that. And we'll talk again more about that next week and in the weeks to come. But I just want to make it very, very clear that as we're about to pray, this is the starting point, not the ending point. So let's close our eyes for a moment. If you're in here today and, and you began to sense a tug on your heart and you realized, I've been traveling down this path of breaking bad 
as the world has described it. And it has produced brokenness and pain to a large degree or to a small degree, but, but all of those are a warning of what is yet to come. And if today you sense God tugging on your heart saying it's time to leave that path, it's time to get on a new road in life that takes you to a place of wholeness and freedom, And it is started by coming to Jesus and, and saying, Jesus, you're in charge. I surrender to your authority. If you find yourself today wanting a new heart, then I want to invite you to say a simple prayer, asking God to do in you what only he can do. And to do in your life for you what you cannot do for yourself. And as we prepare to pray, I also want to say, some of us in this room, we may have prayed in the past, we may believe very strongly in Jesus and what he has done for us, but yet we still remain a slave to our brokenness and our problems. We still are bearing some bad fruit on the tree, and we want to see that changed. And for some of us, if we'll look closely, we will see that we have not surrendered all to Jesus. There are certain areas we have still tried to continue to hold tightly to and and do those things our way instead of God's way. And if that's you, and you sense God tugging on your heart today to renew your commitment to Christ and to give your all to Jesus, then I want to invite you to say this same prayer. So let's pray. Together, as a church family, you can repeat after me. We'll all pray together. If it's in your heart to make this commitment for the first time or as a recommitment, join our church family and say, Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for doing for me what I could not do for myself. I confess I have done my own thing. I have broke bad. And I've experienced the pain and the brokenness. And I've hurt myself. And I've hurt others. And I was wrong. Please forgive me. Today I come to Jesus. I declare you the Lord, the master of my life. I ask you to give me a new heart. I want to clean up my life. I want to do things your way and get your results. But I cannot do it on my own. I need a new heart. I trust you for this, and I commit myself to follow you from this day forward all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, when...